Colossians 2, verses 8 through 15. It'll be on the overhead screen behind me. But if you want to follow along in a different version, the Bible in front of you, it's on page 1166. Please pray with me. <coughs> Almighty God, in you are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Open our eyes that we may see the wonders of your word. And give us grace that we may clearly understand and freely choose the way of your wisdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Colossians 2, 8 through 15. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the universe, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have come to fullness in him who is the head of every ruler and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a spiritual circumcision, by putting off the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ. When you were buried with him in baptism, you were also raised with him through faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in trespasses, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him. When he forgave us all our trespasses, erasing the record that stood against us with its legal demands, he set aside, he set this aside, nailing it to the cross, he disarmed the rulers and the authorities and made a public example of them triumphing over them in it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before our scripture reading, we blessed our children as they go back to school. But it is important to recognize the educators in their lives and sitting in this room now that Sunday schooling currently are many of you who have given of your time and your talent and some of you your life's vocation for the holy work of educating our children according to the ways of God. So if you are a Sunday school teacher, if you work for a school district, uh, either now or in your past, if you are an educator, would you please stand so that we can thank you for your holy work. I know there are some educators out there, and I know we're Presbyterian. So let's go there. It is a form of evangelism to pass on the ways of God to our children. Uh, so if you're not currently an educator in uh, covenant, uh, consider if the Lord is nudging you to a holy vocation. Our second scripture reading comes to us from Matthew's Gospel, found in the 28th chapter, verses 16 through 20. Listen again for God's word. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Sisters and brothers, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may have seen me put these items on the table when I walked up. Big piece of rock and a pitcher of ordinary Boise tap water. Now, which of these do you think 
is stronger. Is it the rock? If I were to throw this on the table, I would probably break this glass, and the worship community would be angry with me. If I were to pour out this water, it would make a slight mess, and it wouldn't break anything now. But imagine if I kept pouring water on this table for a year or thousands of years or millions of years, our friends in the science community say that one of the most powerful forces in the world in which we live is the force of water. It is the force of water that has carved this beautiful section of the Grand Canyon in Arizona. One of God's beautiful wonders of the world. Millions of years of water flowing through, breaking down the rock, the granite, forming the way for the water to flow. And closer to home, Hell's Canyon is the new guy. I still haven't been to Hell's Canyon. But I understand it's even deeper than the Grand Canyon right up the road here in Idaho. And what has carved that out? Not big caterpillar machines the force of water rushing through that canyon for millions and millions of years. Friends, I believe that the power of water is one of the most strongest, most powerful elements that we observe in the world today. But aside from carving through layers and layers of rock, Water is powerful because it has the capacity to nurture life. Think about this Treasure Valley without all of our irrigation canals and dams. If we weren't diverting that precious resource of water for farmers and for us to make sure that our grass is green, we pretty much live in a barren desert. I can't even remember the last time it's rained here in Boise. It must have been back in April. Um, but water, precious water, has the capacity to nurture life. Our bodies are almost 80% made of water. Without water, we have no life as we know it today. We also know that water cleanses us. Hopefully all of us are taking a bath at night to wash away the summer stench of our sweat. Water has this amazing ability to cleanse, not just our body, but I dare say, our souls. And finally, water has the capacity to nurture life. It has the opportunity to cleanse us, but we also know the ability of water to destroy. Back in my native West Virginia, <coughs> The hills are carved out by streams, and you get five inches of rain in those uh, deep mountain valleys. The water rises up quickly, and you see the devastation of flood almost annually because water has the capacity not only to give life, but to destroy as well. Friends, water is incredibly powerful, so it should be no wonder to us that all throughout the scriptures, there are these wonderful images of water throughout the Bible. The first is the creation story. Beginning in Genesis chapter 1, the Spirit of God was hovering, hovering over the waters. And out of the chaos, God creates order from the chaos of the waters. The second large image of water that we have is the story of the flood, where God uses water to destroy the people and the evil ways in which they had lived in Genesis chapter 9. But God had told Noah to build a boat, right? And through the water and the boat lifted up, God was able to save Noah in those waters that can also destroy. In the Exodus story, the Israelites are escaping out of Egypt with the Egyptian army close behind and they come 
to the edge of the Red Sea, and they cry out, Oh God, you have brought us this far only to kill us. And what does God tell Moses to do? To stick his rod into the sea, and the waters divide so that the people of God can march through. God has the power to open the waters, which threaten to destroy, allowing God's people to live. And when they cross through, those same waters come to destroy that which would kill or deceive God's people. Another big image that modern-day Christians don't always talk about is that all throughout the book of law, especially in the book of Numbers and Leviticus, the ancient Israelites were called upon by God to participate in purification rituals. So if they were sexually unclean, God commanded that you would purify yourself with water. If you had touched an unclean animal or blood, you would be unclean, and God would call you to cleanse yourself with water to make you ceremoni ceremoniously clean. Uh, we all have to take care of our bodies, right? Especially after we die, someone has to take care, care of you. Um, and if you were to touch a corpse, God said, you are unclean, and you would only be made clean through uh, ceremonious cleansing ritual. Water is all throughout our scriptures. Uh, and finally, the biggest image that I want to share with you is that our, our Lord and Savior himself, Jesus Christ. He goes down to the Jordan, hearing John's call to repentance, and you wonder, what does Jesus need to repent of? But nevertheless, Jesus goes down into the water and submits himself to immersion by the Baptist and raises up and we have this beautiful image of a dove coming down and God declaring to his people, this is my son, the beloved, listen to him. All of these powerful images of water, and perhaps you too can recall your own uh, images of water as you read the scriptures. Friends, water is powerful. We begin every worship by saying three things. The first is Jesus invites us all to this table of amazing grace, and Polaris said it well today. We are the baptized children of God. So what does that mean to us? Using this font, I've been here for a year and a half now. Can you believe that? Using this font, we've baptized a number of people. Milt Miller has been baptized, Timmy Stroh, Ethan and Elliot Rush, uh, Christiana Todd, Barbara Borgeson, uh, Pam Humphrey. Where about yours, Pam? She was here today. Oh, there she is. <laughs> we've baptized a number of people, and do you know that? Presbyterians baptize infants, that's what we do. But I haven't baptized any infants in the past year and a half. So friends, get to work. We need to make some babies <laughs> so I can baptize a baby. But it's been wonderful to baptize these folks. And here are a few images, uh, light-hearted images of baptism that are pretty short that hopefully bring a good smile to your face. Uh, well, accepted Christ as his Savior and as his Lord, and he will demonstrate his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, by willingly being baptized this morning. We've been waiting on this day a long time. Yeah. And so, Jordan, upon the profession of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son. <laughs> we love to baptize kids, right? It makes our hearts feel good. If this kid is ready to receive those waters. Now, our friends in the Orthodox Church, uh, in the eastern part of the world, also baptize babies like us. But they do it a little differently. Let's go to this one.
Now watch the mother's face over here. <laughs> we love baptisms in the church, don't we? They are beautiful days in my own confession. They are my favorite days in the life of the Christian church because beyond the ways that our children make us smile and laugh and beyond the ways that kids go crazy and moms panic over Eastern Orthodox baptisms, they are beautiful days. But friends, we are the baptized children of God, and hopefully we don't look like this woman all the time as the baptized children of God, right? What does it mean when we start our worship by reminding us that we are the baptized children of God? Sisters and brothers of covenant, I believe that this is foundational to not just our corporate life together, but to your life as well. Sure, we may have received the baptism when we were young and we don't even remember it, but that act is infinitely important for you and for the whole church. And here's why. A little bit of theology behind what we Presbyterians believe about baptism. In these waters, we believe that wherever we find ourselves as sinners, just as Christ was baptized, we are baptized into Christ's death. We die to ourselves, we die to our sins, and we are resurrected in the here and now into a new life, following the ways of love and justice and peace as the people of God. We die to whatever separates for us from God. We are raised to new life in Jesus Christ through these waters that come from the Boise City Water District. In these waters, as Presbyterians especially, we believe that we were called God's faithfulness in our life. One of the reasons why we baptize babies, and I'm going to get to this a little more and later in our service, is that for these waters, they are not indicative of the failed promises that we sinners offer up to God. But rather, these waters are a reminder of God's unfailing promises to us crazy, sinful people. No matter where we find ourselves or how we live our lives or wherever we are in these waters, we are always God's people. Even though we may not be faithful, God is always faithful, even to you and to this church. These waters remind us that we are part of something much bigger than Heaven's Star Trek or Covenant Presbyterian Church. For 2,000 years, God's people have been using plain old water, baptizing folks in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit to bind us into the person of Jesus Christ. So as the baptized people of God, I'm not just Kevin Starcher, but I am God's beloved child. And I am part of a church that exceeds covenant, that exceeds Presbyterians, that exceeds that of the United States exceeds that of this time and place. For when we are baptized in the waters of Jesus' baptism, we join with the church triumphant, with saints in every time and every place, known as the beloved children of God who find our identity in these baptismal waters. A little bit of history, because this is how Christians identify themselves, right? As Presbyterians, we recognize any baptism by any church as long as it's made, done in the name of the Trinity, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is an identifier of who we are and whose we are. Now let's go all the way back into our scriptures, right? In the Old Testament, what was the indicator that you were part of God's people? Circumcision. Thank you for being bold enough to say that in church. <laughs> Sounds a little painful, right? 
Sounds a little exclusive, right? Only men who were part of the Jewish faith bore the identity as the people of God. As Jesus comes along, we find these beautiful words in Galatians because Jesus' movement is a movement of incorporating every nation, every tribe, every people, every sect, every political party into God's kingdom. Paul writes in Galatians, For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. And what's the promise that Paul is referring to? That promise given to Abram all the way back in Genesis 12. That as God's people, you are blessed. Not to have fire insurance from flames of hell. You are not blessed that way. You are blessed to be a blessing. You are called by God to serve other people in this world. When I was back in West Virginia, I was a firefighter, and I wasn't the chaplain. It was great. We just got to wear our black hat, sit in the back of the fire truck, and fight fire. But we had a chaplain. His name was Basil Hensley. And Basil would come up to me, and he'd pat me on the back, and he'd say, Kevin, you know we're both in the fire prevention business. You put out the fires, and the pastor saved the people from the fires of hell. And while it was a, a quaint joke, I am convinced that these waters are much more than fire insurance. In these waters, you find your true identity of who you are and who you are called to be. In these waters, you find the promise of God for your life and for the life of your family and you are an heir to the promise that goes back to the beginning of humanity. That you are blessed to be a blessing in this world. Now, as we often do in the church, we love to fight about things that don't matter, right? So as you look about at the whole family of Jesus in this world in which we live today, about two billion of us who claim Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We love to fight about who has their baptismal theology correct. Oh my goodness, you baptize babies? How do babies know anything about their Lord? And Presbyterians, we would say, oh my goodness, you've been baptized twice? How was God's promise not good enough for you the first time? And we squibble, and we squabble, and we fight about things that don't matter. Do we use a pod? Do we go down to the river? Friends, I believe in our Presbyterian theology. We have a good scriptural basis for as we baptize babies and promise to bring those kids up in a good Christian culture. I believe in that. But I also believe that baptism is one of the most serious things that we do. So we don't just laugh and smile when a kid has their whatever experience with water up here, but as a community, we promise to nurture that kid in the ways of Jesus Christ, because these, these ways are foundationally important. When we argue about baptism, we're arguing about two sides of the same coin. And regardless of the mystery that we encounter and try to describe up here, these ordinary waters, through them God does something incredibly powerful to you. So friends, let us not find ourselves worried about the debates about form and function and baptism. Let us put our trust that God is at work in these cleansing powers of God. Friends, as the baptized children of God, we carry with us certain promises 
that we can take with us to our grave and to our resurrection. And the first is this, that as the baptized children of God, we can believe that God is with us every step of our journey through addictions or through broken relationships or through struggling finances at home, wherever you are as the baptized children of God, you can be certain that God is with you. Friends, as the baptized children of God, we have the authority of Jesus Christ to look hell in the eye and say, God has got this. Why? Because we too have been baptized into Jesus' death and resurrection. As Jesus overcame the power of death and hell, we too can be certain that in our baptism, we can look cancer in the eye. We can look broken relationships in the eye. And as evil and as hard as they are, we can be certain that because God is with us, God has got this. Thanks be to God for God's faithfulness. And finally, as the baptized children of God, we are called to an abundant and eternal life. In Jesus Christ. You know, so many folks in our culture are wandering around trying to find meaning and purpose in whatever it is that they're doing. But friends, as the baptized children of God, we know that our whole identity is found in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Friends, if you haven't been baptized, I don't think you're going to go to hell because you haven't been baptized. Terrible theology. But I do believe that in these waters, we find something certain and beautiful about who you are and who you've been called to be. Sisters and brothers, let us rejoice. We are the baptized children of God. Amen? Amen. 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 As the baptized children of God, we are called to discipleship. We are called to give our lives to Jesus. And part of that giving does involve our pocketbook. Now, what you give is between you and God. But in this time of offering, I encourage you to be mindful of everything that God has poured out for you and how you can live your life in response to God's amazing grace. So that's your support.